great to be with you for the 17th Sunday after Pentecost. We're going to be looking at all four of the readings today. Let's start off with the first reading from Isaiah 50. Um, Isaiah, like uh, 40s and 50s chapters, contain a number of servant songs, and often it is the suffering servant. And really, the suffering servant is one of the most powerful images in this part of Isaiah. The most well-known of these suffering servant passages is in Isaiah 53. I'm sure you uh, recognize it as the first reading for Good Friday. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his stripes we are healed. And Christians find in these passages a, a prophecy of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think of Acts chapter 8, where uh, Philip is sent by God to the, down to the area of Gaza, and there he meets the Ethiopian eunuch who is returning back home. And the eunuch is in his chariot reading from the prophet Isaiah and not able to understand what he reads. And so uh, Philip says, can I help? And the prophet, uh, the, the eunuch says, is this a person talking about himself or is he talking about someone else? And uh, he is uh, then reading there from Isaiah 53. And it says that st starting with the scriptures, uh, Philip explained to the eunuch the good news about Jesus. So here's an example of how the early Christians, even going back to Philip, uh, understood these uh, sections as talking about our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, here in this servant psalm, the suffering servant song, uh, the servant says, I gave my back to those who struck me. We think of the way in which Jesus was treated uh, before the crucifixion, leading up to the crucifixion. And my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. And certainly Jesus suffered terrible insult and mocking leading up to and at the time of the crucifixion. And then the kind of a turnaround, the Lord God helps me, therefore I've not been disgraced. And then that phrase, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. Here, in spite of all of this suffering and the way in which he has been treated and is being mistreated, the suffering servant says, I have set my face like flint. Uh, flint is a very hard rock. It uh, breaks into pieces, very sharp edges, and so in um, early days it was used for, for cutting and for knives and for uh, scraping and so on. And so it's a, it's a symbol of sharpness, determination, hardness, and resoluteness. I have set my face like flint. I am determined to go through this, to endure it, to accomplish what needs to be done. That reminds me of Luke 9, 51, where it says that Jesus, knowing the time was coming for the crucifixion, set his face to go to Jerusalem. He set his face. He was determined he was going to be able to go through with it. And so um, I asked the question, when have you set your face like flint? When have you been so res resolute in your determination that you are not going to let anything deter you? When have you done that? And what was it that made you able to do that? Well, the suffering servant says, what made me able to set my face like flint is the fact that, verse 8, the one who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? It is the Lord God who helps me. Who will declare me guilty? That makes me think of Romans 8, 31, where Paul says, if God is for us, who is against us? Knowing that God is with us, God is directing us, God is watching over us, that enables us to set our face like flint and to be resolute in our determination. Now let's go to the psalm, Psalm 116. The psalmist says, The cords of death entangled me, the anguish of the grave came upon me. And then I called upon the name of the Lord, O Lord, save my life. You have rescued my life from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from stumbling. That reminds me where the psalmist says, you know, um, I am sinking down, Lord, save my life. Reminds me of uh, Matthew 14, 30, where Peter is attempting to walk in the water. He looks at the waves and instead of at Jesus and becomes afraid and begins to sink into the water. 
And he just cries out he, three words, Lord, save me. That's all he needed to say was, Lord, save me. And I'm sure each one of us have been in a situation where the only thing that we could say and the only thing we needed to say was, Lord, save me. And Jesus reached out to him. There's a beautiful, powerful painting of this incident where it's from Peter's perspective, where it's from the perspective of being underwater. And you can look above the surface of the water, looking up, and you see Jesus up there reaching out of his hand in order to save us. Well, when have you just cried out, Lord, save me? That's all you could say, and that's really all you needed to say. When have you experienced something like that? And having experienced that, what are you going to do about it? Verse 12, what shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? In Felix Mendelssohn's oratorio, Elijah, uh, Mendelssohn has the, uh, the widow whose son Elijah raised from the dead sing these words, what shall I render to the Lord, render for all his benefits to me? So because of all that God has done for me, how am I going to respond? When I cried out, save me, he reached out to me. Now, let's now turn to the second reading from James 3. James is the brother of our Lord Jesus. This is not James, the brother of John, one of the sons of Zebedee, but instead this is James, the brother of Jesus, who became a believer after the resurrection when our Lord Jesus appeared to him. And James became a leader in the church in Jerusalem. And as I, I just thought of that, thought of this this morning, with all that James is talking about, has to say about the tongue, it really makes me wonder what kinds of things are going on within the church in Jerusalem. There must have been some pretty nasty talking and gossip going on for him to say things like this in his letters. And so, and to the people to whom he is writing. Well, this picks up on the theme of James 1.26. If any think that they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, their religion is worthless. Remember in last week's second reading, James says, faith without works is dead. If your faith does not lead you to do good, your faith is as good as dead. Well, here, James says that your faith should also lead you to bridle your tongue, to uh, curb what you say. Verse 1, not many of you should become teachers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. I think the principle here is that the greater the authority, the greater responsibility, then comes greater accountability. And I mentioned, I, I list there an incident in Numbers chapter 20. This is the second time where it talks about water coming out of the rock. This time God told Moses to speak to the rock in order to get water out of it. Previous time he has struck the rock, this time he has to speak to the rock. Well, the people have been complaining. This comes towards near the end of the 40 years in the wilderness. And Moses, it just gets to be too much for him. He loses his cool, he disobeys God, he strikes the rock rather than speaks to the rock, and he takes credit for it. He loses his cool, strikes the rock, and says, must I bring water out of the rock for you? Well, he's not going to get water out of the rock. It's God's going to do that. He takes credit for what God was doing. And what's just so striking here is because of that incident, he is not able to enter into the promised land. He's able to lead the people so far, but not all of the way. He can bring them around to the east side and help them conquer the land on the east side of the Jordan River. But then remember how he has to go up in Mount Nebo where he can see the promised land, but he cannot lead them into the promised land. There is greater accountability uh, with greater authority, greater responsibility. <laughs> The more that has been entrusted to you, the more is expected of you. Then, beginning with verse 3, James says, We put a bit into the mouth of a horse, and it guides the horse. I remember um, I've only ridden a horse twice, and I remember the last time. Um, I'm sure that the horse knew immediately that I did not know what I was doing. 
But normally, if you're experienced with a horse, you put a bit into the mouth of the horse and you guide the whole horse. Or you look at a ship. It's a big ship. It takes a lot of wind to drive it. It takes a lot of space to turn it around. The bigger the ship, the longer it takes to turn it around. But a small rudder will guide it. And so the impact of small things. And so James uses the image of the bit for the horse and the rudder for the ship to talk about what a tongue can do with what it says. Now, uh, we here in the West should really relate to verses 5 to 6. How great a force to set ablaze by a small fire. Um, just where, where we used to live in Southern California, a place that I used to, the, the bridge fire going on now burst, came, uh, burst into flames this weekend, and that's a place where I, near where I used to go hiking. But most recently, the huge one in Southern California is the Park Fire. And what an example of how a whole forest can be set ablaze by a small fire. I guess there was a person whose car was burning, and he pushed a burning car over an embankment, and then that allowed it to roll, fall down into a ravine, and then it started the fire. I just, I'm, just, I'm just astounded that someone could be so stupid as to do something like that. Um, here's a map that's just <clears throat> amazing. Up in Northern California by the, the city of Chico, um, remember the campfire from 2018, which pretty well wiped out the town of Paradise. Well, here is the park fire from 2024. And um, th what's just to get a sense of the size of the park fire, what someone has done is they have taken that fire and put it over Los Angeles. And you can see how big it is compared to the whole city of LA. So here, the city is like from the northern end of the San Fernando Valley down to Long Beach. And then from the ocean, Santa Monica, almost over to the 605 freeway. You can just see the, the size of it. And, and so that gives you a sense of how big uh, the park fire was. It was a, I just read some things about it. It was the largest wildfire of California's 2024 California wildfire season. It was the fourth largest fire in California history. And it was the largest fire that was ever caused by arson. Thousands of people were evacuated. 709 buildings were destroyed. 430,000 acres were burned. And it cost over $300 million to fight that fire. All because one stupid person pushed a burning car over an embankment and then allowed it to roll down into a ravine. It's just amazing what can happen, how a fire can grow. And uh, <coughs> James uses that as an image for the, the damage that the tongue can do. And again, what must have been going on in the church in Jerusalem and the churches to whom James was writing for him to talk like this? There must have been some really bad stuff going on. James says about the tongue, it stains the whole body. It sets on fire the cycle of nature and is itself set on fire by hell. So the tongue can be set on fire by hell and then it sets on fire everything. Every creature we can tame, but no one can tame the tongue. A restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we bless God and curse people. Um, just amazing. His powerful description. And, and again, there must have been some pretty bad stuff going on, but I think we who are, you know, just there, there, there are wildfires still going on in the, wildfire, in the fire season. And as we read about those wildfires, think of the terrible, terrible damage that can be done by the, done, done by the tongue and how we need to tame our tongue. And again, James says, but if you claim to be religious, but can't tame your tongue, your faith is useless. Powerful language. So let's now turn to the gospel reading, Mark 8. It really shows us that the most important question in life is, who do you say that Jesus is? 
Let's look at a map and some pictures so we get the setting. Remember that um, prior to this in last week's gospel, uh, reading uh, Jesus had gone up to Tyre and Sidon, this area in Phoenicia, and uh, present-day Lebanon, and had he, uh, healed the, the daughter, the demonized daughter of the woman. And then he came down through the Sea of Galilee down to the Greek culture area, the Decapolis, 10 Greek culture cities, where he healed the, uh, the deaf man who had impediment in his speech. And now he goes back up to this area, Caesarea Philippi. Um, this um, uh, obviously named after to Philip. And uh, so uh, this is really a beautiful area. Let's look at this picture here. Uh, this here is the hillside in Caesarea Philippi. And uh, there was a cave which uh, in ancient times they thought might have been the entrance to the underworld. Um, it is an area where um, it's a natural spring, and so you have water flowing out from underneath the hill, and this is one of the headwaters of the Jordan River. And so it's, it's a beautiful area. Naturally, we, uh, being a place of beauty, um, it also became a place of pagan worship. And so here in Caesarea, here you have the cave, and there are all of these niches that are carved into the, the side of the hill. And these were where various, where various pagan deities, you know, statues of, were placed. Uh, one of the prime deities of this area was Pan, the goddess, god of the forest. And so this is also called Banias. And so here you have an artist's description, a depiction of some of the, the places of worship. Uh, you can see from the size of the people how big these temples were. And you can see how the niches uh, were apart. And so this is a place of idol worship, a place where the powers of darkness and paganism was very, very strong. And in this place where paganism was extremely strong, a place of beauty, uh, but a place of pagan worship, Jesus asks, who do other people say that I am? They give various answers. And then Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And Peter responded, you are the Messiah. The Messiah, remember, is the chosen one. This is the one in Jewish expectation. The Messiah was the one chosen by God who would raise up an army and bring back the glories of David. Uh, Jesus did not want that kind of terminology for himself. And so he sternly ordered not to tell anyone because, you know, if, if we start talking that way, that's going to, you know, start a movement that I'm just not ready for. And uh, the, uh, even on Palm Sunday, the expectation of people is that Jesus would be the conquering king. Blessed is the, the son of David, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, in Matthew, this is not in Mark, but in Matthew, Jesus said, Peter, A+, plus. great answer. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, Greek word for rock is Petra. Jesus is telling a pun. You are Peter, and on this Petra, like petrified forest, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So it's interesting here. Here in a place of, of, uh, of pagan worship, here in a place of idolatry, here in a spiritual darkness stronghold, Jesus says the gates of hell, the forces of Satan, the powers of evil will not prevail against the church. The church is not being attacked, but instead the church is the one who is attacking. In a city, the gates are the place of greatest vulnerability. And so hell is vulnerable. Satan is vulnerable. And the church, here he pictures the church is attacking Satan where he is most vulnerable I think he, uh, like in his lies and in his overplaying his hand and is creating chaos and awfulness, and the gates of hell will not prevail. On this rock I will build my church. Now, the question is raised, what is the rock? What is the rock in which Jesus will build his church? Someone would say, Peter's the rock. Well, the problem is that Peter crumbled the night of the crucifixion. Uh, we need something stronger than Peter to be the rock. Some say it was Peter's faith. Well, Peter's faith often faltered, like when he was sinking into the waves and said, Lord, save me. 
Instead, I think the rock is that statement, flesh and blood is not revealed as to you, but my Father in heaven, is God's revelation of himself through Jesus Christ. That is the rock on which he will build his church. So things are really going great. But then, verse 31, he began to teach them that the gates of hell will not prevail, and I will build my church. But in the meantime, what's going to happen? He began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering. His term for himself, favorite term, is Son of Man, not Messiah. And be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed. And after three days, rise again. He said all this quite openly. Well, Peter didn't like that. And so he took Jesus aside and said, no, that can't happen to you. And Jesus rebukes Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. And then verse 34 it says, he called the crowd with his disciples. Matthew, telling this story, doesn't include he called the crowd, but there must have been others around because in Mark, he called the crowd with the disciples and said, you know, this is what's happening. This is what I'm going to go through. In the end, the gates of hell will not prevail and I will build my church, but it's going to be tough in the meantime. So, if anyone want to become my followers, what do they need to do? Three things. Deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Deny yourself. It doesn't say give up chocolate for Lent. You don't give, deny yourself something that you enjoy. You deny yourself. And that's tough because self does not like to be denied. I often see on Facebook a picture of a dog and it says, a dog is the only thing that thinks, that thinks more of you than it thinks of himself. So, I mean, we, denying ourselves does not come easily. We need to deny ourselves, take up our cross. Um, the taking up my cross is not, some people say, oh, I've taken up my cross. I have, I, have, I have taken on this burden and this concern. Well, a cross is not a burden and concern. A cross is a place of death. Die to yourself and follow Jesus. And then Jesus said, those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake, for the sake of the gospel, will save it. What will it profit you to gain the whole world and forfeit your life? In the end, it's going to be great. I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail. What's it going to be like in the meantime? I'm going to be dying. I will rise from the dead, but Jesus is making it very clear. And if you want to follow me, you need to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Now, I want to conclude then with a picture of Jim Elliot. <clears throat> Jim Elliot's probably most famous phrase is, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep in order to gain what he, he cannot lose. And here's a picture of Jim Elliot. Jim Elliot was one of five people Three of them are graduates of my alma mater, Wheaton College, Jim Elliott, Nate Satan, and, and, uh, and um, Eddie McCulley, Ed McCulley. And they went to Ecuador in the mid-1950s, wanted to reach the whole Aurani people. And they thought that they were making some good progress, but all of a sudden the whole Aurani people killed them. And so they were martyred there in the Ecuador jungle. And then Jim Elliott's wife, Elizabeth Elliott, then goes back and she goes back and evangelizes the people that had killed her husband. And the story through Greats of Splendor and The Savage My Kinsman are story books that she has written. Well, he was the one who said, that's, that's, that's powerful. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. My first year in college, I lived in St. Hall, named after one of them, Nathaniel Saint. My third and fourth years, I lived in Elliott Hall, named after Jim Elliott. And they're powerful, inspirational examples for us. So, the end is, the gates of hell will not prevail. Jesus will build his church. But in the meantime, we need to deny ourselves, as tough as that is, take up our cross, a place of death, and follow Jesus. And let us pray. Our Lord Jesus, we thank you that uh, you have given us the uh, end result we know the end. We know the end of the story, that you will build your church, the gates of hell will not prevail, and that you will conquer sin, death, and the power of the devil. The devil and evil are vulnerable, and they will be defeated, and you have defeated them. 
Help us, therefore, have the ability to set our face like flint. Have, help us to have the determination to do, be your people and to do your work in the meantime. And Lord Jesus, we pray for those whose lives are affected by the wildfires, those who are having to evacuate, those who are wondering if they will need to evacuate. We pray for the safety of the firefighters. We thank you for them, that you watch over them. And as we read about these wildfires, we, we pray that we will be reminded of the total damage that the tongue can do. Help us to show our faith through what we do and help us also to show our faith through your giving us the ability to be able to tame our tongues. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.